When you're in your 20s, 30s, and even 40s, it's a given that you'll be able to gain muscle and improve your body's functionality. But then the questions start to creep in on whether it's possible at your 50 or 60 year mark. And then, I mean, come on, getting into your 70s, 80s, and dare I say 90 or even 100 years old, the doubts are real. But are they founded in science? Well, a study shows intriguing results looking at people in their 60s and 70s. But the study took things a step further by also looking at a group of individuals in their 80s, with some being in their 90s. Here's how it worked. The researchers recruited people for two groups, so the 60 to 70 year old group and another group of people 85 and older. Then all they did was put everyone on a resistance training program for 12 weeks and took before and after measurements of muscle size as well as muscle function. Now, the reason that the researchers wanted to look into this question of improving muscle growth and function in old individuals is because there's good evidence that as we age, especially in our 60s and beyond, that, well, our musculature changes in several key ways. Obviously, the overall effect is muscle loss and strength loss, which ultimately lowers our quality of life because we can't move as well, nor can we do the same things that we could do even in our, well, 50s. But why does this happen? And saying aging sucks isn't an answer. There are mechanisms that have been discovered. For example, over time, our sensitivity to muscle growth is reduced. That means that the cell signaling that gets activated to promote muscle growth, like amino acids from proteins or hormonal stimulation, get blunted through fewer of these muscle growth signals being found within the muscle cells or the inactivation of these proteins through oxidative damage, or one mentioned by the researchers is mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, I've covered this in other content, but muscle growth is highly energy expensive process, meaning in general terms that the protein production machinery within our cells, so it's transfer RNA and ribosomes, require multiple energy molecules, that's ATP and GTP, to produce proteins. If those aren't abundant, protein production for muscle growth does not occur. Guess where those two energy molecules come from primarily? Teleport yourself back to biology class and repeat after me. The powerhouse of the cell, which is the mitochondria. So, if you have more dysfunctional mitochondria, the cellular energy state of the cell is less than ideal for muscle growth. This dysfunction comes from a variety of reasons, but the accrual of damage over time from damaging agents like oxidation are the primary causes. But the, this mitochondrial dysfunction does something else, which is incredibly interesting, but seldom discussed. For your muscle cells to function, they need to be activated by neurons that extend from your spinal cord to the muscle cells. This whole system is called the motor unit. Now, with extreme age, the motor unit disengages its different components, meaning the neuron that was normally in charge of activating the muscle cell to contract pulls away from the muscle cell. This is called denervation. Denervation occurs because of the degeneration of a part of the neuron called the axon, which is the part that communicates with the muscle cell across an area called the neuromotor junction. Anyway, we, we don't need to really get into the specifics, but the axon terminal, the part shown here, the end part of the neuron, distances itself from the muscle cell, weakening the connection between the two. This is also facilitated by mitochondrial dysfunction along with other factors. Okay, so those are a few of the mechanisms, but you know, what the heck, let's do one more and we'll get back to what happened in the study and what it means for you, I promise. Another mechanism is the loss of satellite cells. So satellite cells are these stem cells that sit on top of your muscle cells. I mean that quite literally, they lie on top of the muscle cell and when activated will literally fuse into the muscle cell, donating components of itself into the muscle cell. This helps the muscle cell in producing more proteins for muscle growth long term. It also helps with the muscle cell to return to a previous state of growth and function if the muscle cell shrinks from inactivity. There's a lot of specifics here that I'm glossing over. What you should know is that satellite cell population diminishes with age, so the fewer of these cells can then fuse into the musculature. 
Okay, so what happens when we resistance train at that age? I plan on getting into the specifics of the exact resistance training protocol, including exercises, intensities, and more in the extended version of this video, including a training plan, which is available for you if you are a Physionic Insider. If you're interested in joining the Physionic Insiders, I'd really love to have you aboard. You can find the link in the description box. But let's discuss what happened first, shall we? Surprisingly, if we look at the results here, yes, a bunch of numbers, but don't worry, I'll break it down for you. On the left, we see all the comparisons. So that's body weight, uh, body fat mass, lean mass, including muscle, so L3 muscle CSA, which is a spinal muscle cross-sectional area, meaning the muscle thickness around the spine and so on. The top indicates the people in the 60s and 70s group, and next to that is a group in the 85-year-olds and older. Below that, you can see the before, which is the results before the resistance training, then six weeks into it, and then the after, which is at the end, so 12 weeks later. All the way on the right, we see three different statistical comparison types. Before your eyes glaze over, I'll explain it in one sentence. Time is an effect over time, and group is an effect between the two groups, and time times group is an effect across both criteria. Still confused? Okay, fret not. I'll fix that by telling you that there were only three effects. Here they are. One, waist circumference was reduced over time. Two, whole body lean mass was increased over time. Three, appendicular lean mass was increased over time. So that's lean mass in the arms and legs specifically. So the quick and dirty interpretation is that lifting weights may have improved body composition by reducing waist size, yet increasing lean mass, of which muscle is a component. But what's striking here is that there were no differences between age groups. So people 15 to 20 years older and in their late 80s and 90s still experience these effects. Now, you could argue they didn't have enough people in the study to tease out a difference, and that's actually entirely fair. But as it stands, the statistics indicate no difference between groups. Pretty neat, but we needn't stop there. Two more things that I'd like to show you. One, quadricep size, that's a part of the leg. Here, we're looking at the thickness, more accurately put, the cross-sectional area of the quadricep. The white bars are the 60s and 70s individuals, and the dark bars are the 85 plus. The individual dots are the individual datum from each person so that you can see the overall spread of the data. The first thing that you'll notice is that the younger individuals, 60s and 70s, have a larger starting muscle compared to the white before and the dark before bar graph there. This falls in line with what age that we lose muscle. However, what you'll also notice is that both groups improved over time, and that's why it's statistically significant for a time effect. Okay, I lied. I'm gonna show you three things, not two. In relative terms, we can see that both groups improved. This is a graph of the overall percentage improvement. But not only did they improve, they improved the same amount. Think about that for a moment. People in their 90s are seeing muscle growth similar to people 15 to 20 years younger than them. How freaking cool is that? Okay, last one, and then I'll wrap it up with some takeaways for you. Muscle size is wonderful, but elderly folks usually care more about muscle function and how well that one's muscle can serve them. So let's look at some of the strength data, and we have the same designations as before, so I won't repeat them. Again, strength starts off lower in the 90-year-olds, but again, strength improved in both groups over time. Actually, to give you a bit more of a grasp on this, at the end of the 12 weeks, the 90-year-old group had improved their leg strength by 35 kilograms, which was equivalent to the younger group after six weeks of training. <laughs> I imagine some 90 year olds getting off the exercise machine, flexing and yelling, you want some? And then kissing their bicep and glaring into the mirror. <laughs> However it actually went, uh, these numbers are impressive. Okay, so here's the deal. 
Resistance training definitely improves muscle size and strength when looking at lower body and upper body across all age groups, including 90 year olds and beyond. I didn't report the upper body, but it improved for both groups too. However, spinal muscle size did not improve appreciably, but that may not matter because their spinal muscle strength likely improved. So the spinal benefit is likely also present at all age groups. Additionally, the participants had some mild improvements in body composition as indicated by improved waist size. I don't think the effects were dramatic because fat mass was largely unchanged, but that also isn't a massive surprise considering that nutrition was about the same. So the takeaway is that if you are in your 80s and 90s and beyond, your body is still capable of recovering muscle size and strength, potentially reversing some of the mechanisms that we discussed earlier. If you want the training plan detailed for you, check out the Physionic Insiders. And if you're interested in learning more on muscle growth through some of my other content, check out this video. Bye.